Happy Tuesday. <laughs> happy June. Happy Pride. Hope there's some happy somewhere in your sphere. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening for uh, what we've been calling the Truth and Justice Vigil. Uh, we visioned a space when the justice for Derek, or just justice, <laughs> when the trial justice <laughs> for Derek Chauvin uh, was beginning and uh, envisioned a space where we as practitioners could come together um, in this place where practice meets the hurt of real life uh, and talk about practice, learn together how to navigate this prickly tangled web of race and racism in our country held in this practice where we set this intention toward kindness and goodness. There's a story the Buddha tells that even if someone is sawing off your limbs, you meet them with loving kindness. And I, I, I don't know about you, but that was challenging to recall watching the nine minute and 29 second video. It wasn't loving kindness that arose for Derek Chauvin at that moment. Certainly in moments since it's been more, much more accessible. But that is the question I think we've been grappling with over the last couple of months every Tuesday, 6 to 7.30, is how do we bring our practice closer to the surface in those moments of extreme, of extreme, <laughs> that we're not uh, still defaulting to hate, but sometimes pretty um, acceptable, right? to hate the bad guy, to demonize the bad guy, other them. So we've had um, a Dharma parade, <laughs> if you will, been <laughs> uh, so fortunate to have um, wise and loving and caring teachers of Black African descent who have come and held this space for us each week. Uh, and Mioke has uh, come a couple of times and I think is getting some good vibes from us. Uh, she wanted to come back again and again. So we're happy to have Mioke Kane Barrett, who is the bishop of the Nishran Shu Buddhist Order of North America, the first woman to hold this position. Uh, she's also the guiding teacher uh, and priest at the Myoke Ji Temple in Houston. So she joins us from Houston, Texas. Uh, thank you so much for coming back, Myoke. I'm learning too. <laughs> so. We all are. We all are. Uh, yeah, it's good to keep this in mind, I think, and to keep it in our hearts to work together. So today, I would like us to attempt to do the chanting with the hand movements that I brought up before. So we're going to start that early, but uh, and uh, one of the things I should tell you about it, it's uh, a form of uh, what today we call bilateral stimulation. So it brings together, uh, it activates and integrates both sides of your brain so that they're communicating and working together. It's a good way to uh, strengthen and affect our ability to regulate stress and to reduce stress and also anxiety uh, to help us rebalance ourselves. And 
it can help eliminate sleep problems and any of our triggers, even depression. And I always find, I think I mentioned before that I like to laugh a lot when I do it because it just gets crazy. <laughs> and so um, I thought, yeah, we should do that for a while today and just get into uh, the space of working together that way and seeing how well we can keep connected to each other. So I'm, I would like you to take uh, three deep breaths just to pull us into this space. And come into your pattern of breath very easily and very comfortably. And just scan your body and make sure that it's balanced so that you're not worried about a hip here or a knee there or an elbow, that everything feels in its place so you don't have to think about the body in that way. So what I'd like you to do, invite you to do, is scrunch up your toes and release them. We always carry a lot of tension in our feet without realizing it. And maybe raise up your heels so that you're pressing your toes into the earth. And also to stretch out the arches of your feet. And when you're ready to place them back flat on the ground. And bring your attention up through your ankles, into your calves. And see if there's anything there that needs to be released. and come up over your knees into your thighs. And if you need to contract and release all those muscles in your legs, And then come up to your hips and your pelvic area. Sometimes without realizing it, we carry a lot of stress and tension here. So really check out this area, settle it down, stretch it out, whatever you need to do to relax that part of your body.
and maybe tilt your hips just a tiny bit to help release some of the tension that might be in the base of your spine and around your ribs as you begin the journey upward. into your chest. As you expand your lungs and your chest cavity to be as open as possible. You might want to twist just a little bit in case there's any tension in your back so that the expansion of your chest with the pure breath begins to feel like light. And into your shoulders and down to your arms through your elbows, to your wrists, and into your fingers. And clench and release your fingers. Circle your wrists inward and then outward. Rest them comfortably on your legs. And come back up to your throat, into your neck, and find all those places that might be tense. To move your head side to side in a circle to just release. So when you're ready, Open your eyes and continue to breathe. Hope you are relaxed and at ease so we can get a little crazy. Thank you. You're not going to see my face for a little bit. So we can, yes. Can you see my hands? <laughs> yes, we can see your hands. Okay, good. <laughs> so the first step is the gasho hands for Namu, Yo, down to your lap, Ho, Ren. Okay, kill, sorry. Namu, yo, ho, ren, gay, kyo. See, I can't do this slow. <laughs> then the second step is namu, yo, ho, ren, gay, kyo. And this third step, namu, yo, to the left this time, ho, Ren, gay, kyo. So what we're doing, you always end up back on your legs. So this is namu, myo, ho, 
Ren Ge Kyo. The first one is releasing negative karma and energy. Namu Myo Ko Ren Ge Kyo. Bringing in good energy, loving kindness and compassion. And the third step, Namu Myo Ko Ren Namu, sorry. Myo ho ren ge kyo. And essentially uplifting the Buddha with your hands. You know, because that's part of what uh, we call the Rai Hai in our form of Buddhism, where we put our hands like this. So the Buddhas, we're uplifting the Buddha with our hands. Miyake, I wonder uh -huh. if you could just take a few minutes to talk about the meaning of Namu Myoho Ren. Sure. Okay. Um, Namu means devotion or respect for what follows. It's kind of a derivative of Namaste, um, but not quite, because there is no such uh, the Namu. Uh, is more for the sound, which is why it's kind of derivative from namaste. But it does mean devotion and respect for what follows. Myoho Renge Kyo is the title of the Lotus Sutra in the Japanese pronunciation of ancient Chinese. It is also, if you um, heard it in Sanskrit, it would be Sadama Pundarika Sutra. So what we are chanting is devotion to Myoho Renge Kyo. Myoho meaning a wonderful or mysterious Dharma. Renge is lotus flower uh, because the lotus flower signifies cause and effect since it's the only plant that produces a flower and seed at the same time. And it also is uh, symbolic of the fact that essentially no mud, no lotus, um, that you become, even in the midst of this Saha world, living in the mud, that uh, your Buddha nature is untouched by that mud. And then Kyo is sound or vibration or sutra. So essentially it means the sutra of the lotus flower of the wonderful Dharma. And we chant it, uh, because it's one of the simplest ways uh, that our founder discovered that it could be shared to everyone without regard to education, background, you know, their ability to economics and all that kind of stuff. Anybody can chant and you don't have to do anything else but that. The thought was that chanting uh, was so powerful that it encompassed the chanting of the entire Lotus Sutra itself, because there's no separation between the title and what's contained within the Sutra. And so it's been uh, a practice that was established in 1258 and has been ongoing ever since. Um, it's, it's not that it was not known prior to that, it's just that it wasn't the correct time. And so in China, they never articulated um, the chant itself. Does anybody have any questions about that? Is that clear? Okay, so when <laughs> opposite, <laughs> right? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to see, are we seeing opposite each other? I think we are, right? Yeah, so it would be right, left, right, left, then left, right on the last one. So we'll start slow so we can try to get into it. Uh, and then when we start to feel comfortable together, we can go a little bit faster because it gets pretty uh, intense and lots of fun because, and don't worry about if you uh, mess up because we all mess up. I see that I've been messing up the whole time I've been trying to teach you how to do it. Um, 
because I always get a, a little bit wacko here. So uh, any other questions? Everybody ready? Okay. So it's Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. That was backwards. See what I'm telling you? <laughs> so, Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. Namu, Myo, it should be right. Ren, Ge, Kyo. Thank you, Chris. Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. 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 Now you have to say it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> Namu, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. 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 
I saw you laughing. <laughs> I'm glad you gave us permission to laugh. And oh, be, yeah. Be, yeah. <laughs> well, we're supposed to be able to find joy and laughter in our in our faith and practice. I'm, I don't like being serious all the time. Even though what we just did was very serious. You know? <laughs> You're getting rid of any negativity or negative karma and bringing in uh, you know, good karma, compassion, loving kindness, things that shore up your life. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, you're welcome. Well, just imagine what will happen when you guys get together in the same place. And you can do that together. You'll be rolling on the floor by the time it's over. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. Everybody screws up. Any other questions? I will say to uh, Jenny's point about the energy, I've um, had the chance to chant with a Nishran group here in the Metro and uh, they like for an hour long chant first be on time or else you'll never be able to catch up the, <laughs> with the rhythm. But it is, it's indescribable the, the power that is generated from chanting in a group together oh, yeah. without break with such uh, dedicated attention and care. It's so incredibly powerful. Well, I will have to send you the link to our, we do uh, every full moon, a 24 hour chanting session that goes around the world. So you'll hear it all different ways, fast, slow, medium, um, from different people. And um, it's just pretty incredible. But we've been doing that for over a year now, just to keep ourselves going, just kind of like your truth and justice vigil. So that we chant together and just try to bring it home. So the reason, that I, I wanted to do that chant and the um, exercise together of all the hands flying and everything. <laughs> uh, there's a concept we have called Itai Doshin, which means many or different bodies in one mind. And when you have different bodies with one mind, for example, doing that together, it builds up this energy flow and this, this current that runs throughout the room um, that somehow brings you closer together. And like you were saying, Stacy, going into one of those chanting sessions is that you could be in a room full of people you don't know, but that charge, that energy brings you closer together than you could imagine. You know, there's some kind of relationship built up just the fact that you're chanting together. Um, and I think of it, especially in this time, because so many of us and are trying to come to terms with what happens, uh, what's happening in this time and place, and it seems relentless you know, everything that's going on politically, socially, and, you know, the fact that after something as horrific as what happened in those nine minutes and 29 seconds, um, that people are still not getting it. You know, they're still coming up with ridiculous things like here in the state of Texas, for example, um, permitless gun carry, or they're calling it constitutional carry. So you don't have to have a permit. You don't have to have a license. You don't have to do anything. You're allowed to carry a gun. And we already have enough crazy people here in Texas who love their long guns and walk around the street carrying these kinds of weapons. And there's such an energy running through 
And that's what I've been thinking about a lot lately because of those who believe the big lie. How do we counter that in the midst of all, everything that's going on? It's like piling up one thing after another, after another. And it's like we're being called, those of us who can center the love that we have for all of us, the love that we have for the entirety of the planet. And, you know, and we know that you know, George Floyd is just symptomatic of what's broken and all of the rest. I mean, it's still happening and it's all telling us that it's broken. The relationships are broken. And I think of Buddhism as a, a relational practice because we can always know exactly where our lives are by the nature of the relationships we have with others. And our practice tends to mirror what's in our internal world so that out in the environment, we tend to see that. You know, you can imagine that if you were not really working on your life and your practice through faith, that possibly all the negative things out there would be coming your way. And I feel certain uh, that practice and the knowing that we have about the ability of the Dharma to transform and to build up our lives and our strength of faith and practice, that those things may not come our way because we have built in a, a level of protection, a level of kind of like a force field around us so that we're able to repel that type of thing. At least I like to think so. And it is said that um, the mind is like a garden and we must be very careful what we're planting in it. So I choose every day to plant in it the knowing that how I think about my life and my world is what will manifest. So I always think of a, a world where I have good relations and beauty and harmony so that I'm not pulling in the negative. And it, it's in truth, I can't watch the news every day because I'll get very upset and really have to work on myself to uh, not be in judgment about those who don't think the way I do. But I also have to know that there are tons of people out there who think the way I do, the way we all do, that we want a peaceful, harmonious world. And we want um, a place where we can all thrive. So this is where the concept of different bodies with one mind and how if, as we can continue our faith and practice to embody that principle, that we embody the fact that there are people out there who just as we are, even though they may be of a different faith tradition, are all working towards the same goal that we are working towards. And how do we find those people? And how do we work in tandem with those people? And sometimes we can get together and do interfaith things or intra-faith things. But also I think we may not have to actually get together if in our own communities, we're creating a groundswell of this one mind that is dedicated to healing our world and healing the earth and healing the relationships among all, all living beings. Our founder, uh, Nitran Shonen, always talked about the fact that we have to establish a place uh, that peace can be born, that peace can uh, live, that peace can be um, grown and find its natural home. And this is where we all are. 
And so somehow our embodiment of the truth of the fact that we are essentially one and that we have the ability through our faith and practice to, as someone said in here uh, before, skillful means. We learn how to have skillful means to interact with others, to help them come closer to where we are simply because we are in harmony in the sense of being of one mind. And it's gonna take a lot of us. And I'm, I always think that's what keeps me going and keeps me from losing a sense of hope about this. Because as long as I know that I can practice and I can uh, practice the paramitas every single day, using the generosity of spirit, the generosity of laughter and love for other beings and patience and perseverance and our wisdom and meditation, that somehow we are making a change because we can greet people with the kind of embodiment that the Buddha keeps telling us we all have. You know, I'm, I'm always reminded that the Buddha said, we can achieve exactly what he achieved. And it is open to us because as our father, as our teacher, as the person who has given us guidance for how we live, there's a lot to be said about what we embody through that. And we've been studying uh, the Lotus Sutra quite a lot lately. And then one chapter we studied was about the fact that he guaranteed awakening to all beings simply through practice and faith and study. And that's an amazing thing to carry with us as we walk about the world that doesn't look like what we want it to look like that doesn't embody the love and joy that we all feel through our ability to practice Buddhism. And so if we can remember the principle of different bodies and one mind, we all as Buddhists have that mind of awakening and we can work together and we can create a better world simply through our own efforts. So that's what I wanted to bring to you this evening. So I'm open to any questions or more chanting, if you wish, so, or a discussion about what I've said. I'm so grateful for study because every time I read something, new ideas, uh, new pathways open up and the deeper I get into it, it's like, wow, who knew, you know, the end. It's such a, a gift, I think, that we have to be able to study the teachings of the Buddha and really put them deep into our lives. And it's, it's a lifelong endeavor. And that's what's so wonderful about it. So we don't have to rush or feel guilty because we didn't do this every single day, you know, that we have all the time we need. Thank you. One of the things I think we uh, forget is how we feel on the inside is always evident, even if 
we don't realize it, but it's evident to uh, others who may, even if they don't know us, can feel what it is that we might be feeling. Um, you've been in situations, I'm sure all of us have, where we've met someone who instantly you felt like this is not a person I need to be around, right? Or somebody's acted that way to you and you don't know what's going on. But there's some kind of uh, relationship that gets established almost immediately that can be felt in your environment. The times you know that you're not safe, the times you know that um, this person even if it's not going to be a physical confrontation might mean you harm. And we tend not to pay attention to those things because we've always been taught, don't judge a book by its cover, all those kinds of things, or don't go by your first impression. So we tend to negate how our physical being interacts with the external world until we get proven right time after time after time. And it's something um, also you can see in your environment from the standpoint of who lives in your neighborhood, the people that happen to come to where you are. One of the things I recall in my past experience was uh, living in a neighborhood and we lived down the street from a park and there were uh, lots of drug addicts and alcoholics hanging out in the park. So the one thing, a group of us who, uh, there were two families on the street that we practiced together. And so we got a group together and started talking to all those addicts about the Dharma. And ultimately they all left the neighborhood and the neighborhood was transformed because they were made welcome, even though they didn't want to be welcome. And so they left, but it, the neighborhood itself became uh, uplifted totally uh, to become a different place. And, and a lot of times we don't have those relationships with our neighbors that we're able to see that um, because of, you know, I don't know how people are today sometimes that they don't know how to just be neighborly. And so a lot of times it's up to us to make that movement towards uh, just being a welcoming presence in the community. And I may have shared with you um, all before the time I went to a church where everybody hugged each other and um, displayed what I thought was inappropriate behavior. <laughs> you know, because they would just hug each other and say, I'm grateful for the good in your life. And it was like, wow, these people are strange. But what I noticed happening, because they created that um, place where there was nothing but goodness happening, that people were always called out and, you know, their goodness was praised and welcomed and acknowledged, that it actually became that place. And so we can see that collectively we can do that, but even our own uh, individual efforts towards embodying what we feel inside and cleaning up that place inside, that our lives are mirrored in our environment. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay, I wonder if you could talk a bit more. The, the pendulum swings far, right? Mm -hmm. So you asked us to remember a time where we knew we weren't safe because we had had that experience. And the other end of that is we heard of a time when maybe someone wasn't safe and so, or something happened, or we're just fearful that something might happen based on some cursory or experience or, and so then we take on that stance. So can you talk about discerning, like, you know, this thinking mind 
and really the dropping into the body. How do you discern, make that discernment? It's just, I mean, physical safety can be more explicit, mm -hmm. um, but it, it gets so nuanced to our ability to like, discern those places and spaces where I'll, I'll just say, okay, not even safe to approach someone, a drug addict in the park or in the neighborhood. <laughs> <Yeah>. We have... <laughs> We have, you know, these stories of what could happen, this tipping into anxiety and what has happened. So I'm just wondering if you can talk some about discernment and balancing in this reflex. Yeah, I always notice it first in my body, always. Um, and once I recognize that, then I've just had to go inward to see exactly what that was. Was it how deep it went? You know, if I was really going to be harmed or felt that I was going to be harmed. Because um, I've done some mighty stupid things in my life, especially when I was younger and not paying attention and surprised that I survived it. Um, but there was something there that alert alerted me to a place where I was really not safe and not in the sense of being physically harmed but that kind of emotional uh, mental suffering that one can go through um, when someone disrespects you so deeply that it takes some time before you really understand what that is you know it's more acute for me now because I've gone into how I'm feeling enough to know what it feels like uh, when someone disrespects me or uh, dismisses or whatever you can call that, that you are not even human anymore. There's something that happens very much physically. It's like, um, like being hit upside the head with a baseball bat or on your back with a baseball bat. That kind of intensity of the feeling. And that indicates to me that this is harmful, not on a physical plane, but on an emotional or spiritual level. It's easier to get out of a physical uh, threat because somehow um, if we think like warriors, we become warriors and it doesn't necessarily have to be that physical thing where you're gonna beat somebody up, but just the ability to stand in your truth that you will not accept what is coming and you will not tolerate what someone else is trying to do. I have found that it keeps people intending to harm at bay. But it all comes back to the fact that we have to shore up ourselves, that we have to come to a place of loving, respecting, honoring who we are. And I know for a lot of us, it takes a long time. Because um, I, I don't think it really happened for me until I was in my mid 30s that I finally realized nobody else was going to stand up for me. So I had to do it myself. You know, and the surge of power that one gets because it is based on the truth that you are worthy of love and respect and kindness from throughout your life. And that we have to claim it for ourselves. And I think it comes from the standpoint that uh, getting into the work of your internal world that we're constantly working on, because we have all the truth, all the answers that we need, everything we need to be victorious in life, we have at our disposal. And we just have to 
remember to wake up to the fact that it's there. It's always been there. But it's also been hidden because we were taught so many different things that didn't acknowledge that Buddha nature, that ability to see what the Buddha saw. And I would be willing to bet there are times that you have seen and can really tell without even thinking about it, uh, the nature and character of a person you've met. And it's something we don't think about. But something says to you, this person isn't quite right there. Or this neighborhood isn't quite right there. And it's the ability to get away from the things that are seen, but to also go deeper than what's on the surface. I think Buddhism gives us a remarkable sense of self, even though we talk about no self. But I like to think of self as a skillful means and how we navigate getting through self so that you can ultimately lose self, right? That um, all of the work that we do through our faith and practice because of who we showed up as in this life is a choice we made simply by how we lived our lives. And that choice is one that um, if we accept and recognize that choice, then that also means we can choose how to respond to the things that come into our lives and use them for our benefit, for our good. I find that we get to a place where we are not, at least I am not, there are times I'm no longer female. I'm no longer this body. I'm no longer all the things that define me. It's just, I am, you know? And it's kind of a, a surprise sometimes when I'm brought back to the fact like, oh, I'm a woman, <laughs> you know? Or, oh, I'm a short person or an older person, you know, or a fat lady, you know? And it, it's, I, I don't think about those things sometimes, that I'm able to walk and just be this being that is not defined until somebody reminds me. Now, I don't know if that makes sense, um, but I tend to love those times. Did that get anywhere to it? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I, I, I aspire to that awakening or that jolt back into being a physical being resulting from external forces. It's usually my head, my thinking, my own mind that keeps me constricted. Yeah. Don't forget. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that we have oh. like many awakenings that it's not a finite point. It's that peeling that onion kind of experience. That we are not defeated by the things that come to us. The, you know, the stuff that happens, you know, the people we meet that knock us off our shoes, you know, that you're standing there thinking, or, or just being who you are, and you might meet somebody that just kind of throws you off. That all of the answers to why this is happening and what you need to do to overcome it is you already have the answers. It's just a matter of finding them. You know, because most of us, I think, before becoming Buddhists, never really explored our inner world 
to the extent that we are able to do so now. And so we missed some of those great gifts that we have inside. And the experiences of the times when we had to be victorious, when we had to win. So we all have the capacity to win over our circumstances because we've done it before. And it may be a small one, you know, uh, or it could be something you know, absolutely monumental where you really had to have patience with yourself and persevere through the worst of it. And um, somehow you did it. And that's what we're uncovering through our exploration of ourselves. That that resource, so to speak, is there. That capability we have to respond in such a way that lets us stand exactly where we are and maintain our truth. That's what I mean. Thank you. As long as you need it to, because you're driving this bus right here. And it can happen in an instant or it could take a long time. One of my early situations was uh, I had a boyfriend and I grew up in a home where my father uh, used physical punishment, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. And so uh, inside there was a part of me that swore I would never allow another man to hit me. And I had what I thought was a nice guy I was living with and he seemed to admire the person I was. But he also was extremely jealous, which I didn't find out until later when his friends would come over when he wasn't home and I'd invite them in and sit down and have a conversation while we were waiting for him. And um, he got really angry with me one day and hit me. And I don't know what happened, but I was overtaken by this insane rage. And I took off my shoe and I out of him with my shoe. And he was freaking out because he couldn't understand what was happening with me because I was this mild mannered person. Uh, but something snapped at that moment. And uh, so he eventually had to hold on to me to keep me from hitting him. So he had these lovely bruises all over his chest. I was very proud of myself. Um, <laughs> and so I actually moved out the next morning, as did he. And we ended up in the same apartment building and couldn't get out of the lease. So he lived upstairs from me. And the entire time that... Um, we lived like that. He would call my father and he would, you know, just do crazy stuff. And it was at that moment, I realized that the only answer to getting out of the situation had to do with me. That how I handled that situation was going to make a big difference. And that was only because I was chanting about the situation and it took about a, a six months and we finally got to a place where we could talk to each other without trying to kill each other. But um, it was a tremendous learning experience. And what changed it finally was that my house caught on fire, my apartment caught on fire. I don't know why or how my apartment caught on fire, but it did. And it freaked him out so much that uh, it turned everything. Um, but it was also my moment of great transformation from being this mild mannered female who just took stuff and to being one who stood up for myself. And that was only layer number one, <laughs> right? 
because it was like I had this incredible power for a while, realizing that I could take care of myself. And I didn't need to have a man around to do that. Um, but it was, you know, getting rid of being naive and just complacent about where I was in the world. And it's been to get where I am today has been hard won. But it's also been a tremendous gift to be able to recognize and realize the places that I've been that have led me to where I am today. And so I can feel good about what I've done. And it's all based on my faith. And so I can understand now the faith of anyone because we all have that kind of stuff to go through, right? All of us, it's different for all of us. But especially I think uh, for women to recognize our worth and our right to be able to stand up for ourselves, our right to be able to love ourselves and to be treated with respect and dignity and not have anybody try to touch that. And we all have that fight within us. We are all warriors like that, you know? And it's just a question of when it gets triggered that you have to really take care of yourself that it comes out. It's a, the questions that you ask yourself to get yourself out of your own way um, in the sense of, like when that situation happened for me, my father was one of the, <laughs> the uh, people that came to interrogate why I wasn't with this wonderful man anymore. And I, all I had to say to him was that no man will ever hit me. And it also changed our relationship. Because when he heard that, you know, it was like a recognition of what he had done. Uh, and um, I, I personally never cursed my father or disrespected him in that sense, you know, because I was the eldest. And so, you know, how you carry all that eldest baggage that, um, you don't get to say all the stuff you want to say, but I found ways to tell him about my life uh, in such a way that he could respect it. And it also brought me back to the point that he had told us uh, one time was that if you can live your life in front of me without shame, then I will accept it. And so that was a, a guidance I started to live with. And so I was always asking myself, you know, can I do this in public? Can I do this with pride? Can I do this and be true to myself? And so those were the kind of questions at that time that I was bringing up for myself. You know, and, and what kind of people did I want in my life up to that point. So I started at, even at that uh, time to discard people that weren't in my life for my best good. And not in a negative way, you know, it's just like moving on and recognizing that relationships with people who didn't respect me or care, really care about me were uh, detrimental to how I felt about myself. And I was really eager to fight for myself and for my father, who as a result of my practice, um, we became really, really good friends. And so I was able to respect and appreciate all the gifts that he gave me in spite of um, the physical punishment and was able to heal that as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. Fear is a tough one. Um, and one of the things I heard was uh, that I could trust people to be exactly who they are. And the important thing was to trust myself to be able to deal with those people. Um, fear, fear becomes, sometimes can become a prayer. You know, that if you fear something happening, you start to attract it to you. You know, it's like, um, well, like my father, it's my primary example of this because it taught me a lot was he would say he was not going to live to see another Christmas because he was never going to outlive his father. And that was his thought, you know, that he had. And so every year at Christmas, he said, well, this will be my last Christmas. And it was kind of like, oh, dad, come on. But he did not outlive his father. And what that taught me, because I have outlived my dad, um, was that I don't have to make that true for me. That we always are uh, say things like, well, if your father had high blood pressure or your high cholesterol or heart attack, that's gonna to happen to you. And, and people used to tell us that stuff. And so I, I walked around with fear that I was gonna die at a certain age until I realized that I was driving the bus, <laughs> you know? It says, okay, I could change the way I ate. I could do all kinds of things to make sure that doesn't happen to me. But the most important thing is that I had to not choose that outcome. And fear makes you choose an outcome that you have no intention of fulfilling. It's just like walking around saying, I'm gonna be harmed every day I walk outside. And it's, the temptation is to do that because we've been in this pandemic thing. But the other thing is to be able to say that I can handle whatever happens. And I'm strong enough and capable enough to handle whatever comes my way which is kind of putting up that force field. And so, so far, it's been working like a charm. <laughs> so I make powerful prayers about my well-being in the world instead of my lack of safety in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miyake. Thank you for sharing your stories, chanting with us, laughing with us. And just a reminder, no matter the what tradition we're practicing in, this tr transformation happens in our heart, in our mind, like enables us to face all that arises in this life. And I think you portrayed that uh, remarkably and just your life and your story. So thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. <laughs> <laughs> and we are so happy to have you here with us and happy to be able to support your livelihood. Um, many of you here know that Common Ground uh, operates on Donna, the generosity of folks just like you, and that's how we're able to support the center and support teachers and guest teachers by the generosity of those that, who have come before. And so I invite you, if you're able, willing, to visit the Common Ground website and look for the Truth and Justice Vigil and uh, make an offering to support Miyoke's livelihood so that she may continue to bring her wise, gentle teachings to those who are yet to come.
deep gratitude for all of you and your practice. Thank you again, Miyoke. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you.